If you have your Bible, please open to 2 Samuel chapter 24. I should say, um, this is the last chapter of 2 Samuel. And after we're done with Samuel, we're going to have two sermons on the book of Philemon. Um, probably most of us have never gone through, could go through our lives without hearing a sermon on Philemon, a very short book. But we will be covering that. Um, one sermon. Maybe that's a message. I shouldn't use this. Um, we'll be preaching two messages from Philemon. It's an excellent sermon. Actually, well, excellent book, I should say, on the whole nature of forgiveness of debt and the loyalty we have in Christ. Um, this is from the first centuries of ours. It's actually about a slave owner and his runaway slave and their relationship. I trust that it will be a wonderful book. I haven't gotten a chance to look at it, but I'm looking forward to it. And after that, we will have two messages on Jude, and after which we will start with the Gospel of Luke and work through the work through the book. It'll take us a little over a year, and that's going to be very good. Looking forward to that. If you have your Bible, please, um, let's look at the last chapter of 2 Samuel. In many ways, this is a very strange ending for a book. Usually for at the end of a book, you want an ending such as and they live happily ever after. Or the idea that the sheriff rolled off to the sunset, you know, after getting rid of all the bad guys. This is the kind of ending we expect, especially in a sense for the greatest king of the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, David. And that's what we would expect. But instead, we have this account, again, of the anger of God at the end of this book. And it seems very strange that you would actually end a book this way, even for a book in the Bible. Many books of the Bible have very happy ending. Revelation, for instance, that, and the book of Job, even though God struck Job greatly, the book ended with a happy ending. We can talk about Genesis and also all the Gospels. Why is this book ending this way? Well, the short answer is it's intentional. See, the author of this book is communicating to us through the Spirit of God that at the end of the day, as great as David the king was, he was not enough. He was not enough to save us. There has to be someone else who will save his people. Who will save God's people, but this, is, this someone has to be like David. Because David is kind of the anointed one of God. So there has to be someone else who's anointed one like God. But David himself was not enough. Well, we know the story, of course. If I were to say Benjamin, who is the, who is the Messiah that we need? It's Jesus. This is a knee-jerk reflection answer. We all know the answer. But sometimes we need to go back and work how we actually got there. And so this is really the what chapter 24 is for. And, then the, and it's actually the final problem in the, at the end of this book is that there's still the anger of God that has to be dealt with. 
And there are really three questions that the book is seeking, is answering, addressing. And one of the questions Paul read already, why is this happening? Verse 17 says, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Folks, that's one of the questions. But the first question I want to ask this morning is, who is enough? Let's start out looking at this question. And the problem, how do you deal with the problem of the anger of God? Do you notice how this book actually started? What's the first word? Now, the fact the book begins with again means that this is something that's either a repeated incident or is something that happened at least one time. So this is something probably it goes back to chapter 21 when we went, remember we covered chapter 21 where there was a great big famine because of Saul's son's sins. But the pa passage itself actually doesn't tell us that. And in, in a sense, leave us hanging what this again actually meant. And the natural way to see, think is actually this is something that's repeated over and over again. And this actually very, seems almost disjointed why the chapter would start with this word again. Except to tell us that this is something that just keeps happening. And right away you're thinking, you know, this is about the end of David's life. Aren't there supposed to be a solution? And it says, he, it says again, what? The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And this whole thing, even about the phrase about the anger of the Lord, kind of throws you off. Why do I say that? Because a couple of chapters ago in the Songs of David, when it talks about the anger of the Lord, it's a reference to God's anger against the Gentiles, against the enemies of God's people. Now, we all like God's anger against the bullies, right? Against a coworker that treats us poorly. Against our wives? No. Husbands? No. But we all know about God's anger against other people. But God's anger here is directed at Israel, his people. And we don't know the nature of that anger, but what is, throws us off is this. And he incited David against them. This is the hardest part of the passage. God was angry with his people. And to have a reason for his anger against his people, he used Now, this passage is really challenging for us for a couple of reasons because you, you're, you're kind of questioning, you know, how could that God use David against, you know, use, how, how do you do this whole free will thing? How do you have free will and actually God can actually, in a sense, channel you? That's a question for us. But the bigger question for Jew is this. The Messiah is David. Messiah with a small m. He's the anointed one. He was supposed to protect God's people. But instead, he becomes an instrument whereby God judges his people. Now, there's 
something. This is really strange. And to a Jew, it's like, how could that be? How could the Messiah be like that? The reason why is that God is communicating through his Bible, through his word, that the Messiah ultimately will have to save his people spiritually. You see, David was a man who's like us. He's filled with sin. And if you're going to ask the question, how could how does the will of God, how does God's will work in this instance? Let me give you a real brief illustration. We, in a sense, are like a stream. A stream always flow what? Downstream. And it doesn't matter how much blockade you put, how much barrier you put, the stream will always only flow downstream. And what the Bible actually teaches us is that we actually have what? Sinful nature. And so the fact is that we all struggle with our sins. And left to ourselves, we can go different ways, different desires, but we will always pick our own selfish desires. And this, in a sense, Shows us, you know, so God was going to judge, discipline his people. He can choose all the different means. But this time he used David. And so he showed them that they, the king and the savior they need is actually someone else. Let's talk about the nature of this sin. He said... So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. Now, does this sound like a sin to you? Is it wrong for the United States government to take census of its people? It's not wrong to take census. And it's not clear, really, to, to, to most, a lot of scholars right now, why is this a sin? But I think the best guess is this. The reason why this is a sin is because the reason why David is numbering the people. The reason why David is numbering the people is he wants to build up his army. Let me read the next sentence. This is what Joab actually responded to the king. But Joab said, said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eye of my lord the king to still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the command of the army. So Joab himself, himself knew what was wrong. And the question also is, what came before this passage? What came before this passage is a list of David's mighty men. And David is actually filled with this amazing army already. He shouldn't have to list, call, number any more soldiers. But he wants it for pride. And brothers and sisters, this is actually very good. Reminded for all of us. You know, pride could come up in so many different ways. We don't even see it. You know, sometimes, like, maybe in a succession over our grades, our money, our bank account, even their friends. You know, on surface level, wanting to know your GPA or to be, to be responsible financially is a very good thing. To be a good student is a very good thing. But you can easily become pride. 
And this is what we have to be careful in all of our lives. You know, the this, this sin of pride is something that kind of it could grow out very easily. And it's because this is all always starts in our hearts. So here the king actually went, I mean, the king actually told Joab to go out. And he counted the army, and he gets his number. Um, the army and the commanding of the Joab and the command of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Aurora and from the city that is in the middle of the valley toward Gad and on to Jezer. Then they came to Gilead and to Kadesh in the land of Hittites. And they came to Dan and from Dan they went out around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hittites and Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Jordan at Beer, Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave the sum of numbering of the people to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. That's a lot of people. And I believe that David must have been struck in his conscience because of his lack of trust in God. And this leads to our second point here in this passage, which is the passage that Paul had read. It says, but David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And then when David woke up the next morning, the, serp, um, the prophet came and said to, said to David, Thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of the three. So what's it? Three years of famine, three months of persecutions, or three days of pestilence. What does David say? David said, a very wise thing, he says, let me not fall in the hands of, the man, of man. Let me fall in the hands of the Lord. Well, that would get rid of option two. Option two is being persecuted by enemies for three months. This leaves option one and option three. And option one, I guess, happened already in a couple of chapters. And, and the most manifest evidence of God's work was actually the plague. So he got the plague. The 70,000 men who were actually wiped out um, in, in three days. And so... In 16, it says, And when the angel stretched out his hand against Jerusalem to destroy, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel, Was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was stayed by the threshold floor, threshing floor, ever in ruin of the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned. I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Here's the second question. David sinned, and 70,000 men died. And the question that David had is, why? And if it is so, who can bear the burden of his sin? Now, on the outline, I actually divided. It's a little different. On the outline, I actually said David as a king, as a prophet, and as a priest. David as a king is not enough because God incited his, his anger through this king. Here's David serving as a prophet. He's speaking to the Lord. And the prophet is supposed to bring out God's word to God's people. But David doesn't know, even know how to bring out that word to God's people because he can't comprehend why God would strike down 70,000 men because of him. He 
here's the thing. These 70,000 men really were probably, probably the man David numbered. But they also died because of David as their leader. Remember the other chapter we went through back in 21 in which Saul's son died. Saul's grandsons died for Saul's sin. And we said at the time, you know, this is a very challenging passage. And in fact, this is not how God would do things. Sons are not put to, to be put to death explicitly for the sins of their fathers. But this case was actually different. And the reason why it was different was in the sense Saul broke the covenant, but, and also because the sons represented the father. Now here's the thing. David here. He represented a nation. And his sin became their sin. You know, I thought about this passage. It's hard sometimes to be, to be a leader. You know why? Because I see my sins in you. If you've been around our church a long time, you eventually I rub off. Um, I'm a cat. I'm a coward. And I see that rub off at times. I would like to get together with just a small group of people and kind of ignore other people. And that's a sin. And whether you're a leader, a father, we all have a tendency. Now, I know in our church sometimes, what's the other extreme? Then don't be a leader. But we have been talking about the parable of the talent in our Sunday school class. And there's something in there that I finally understood. You know, there's the man with the one talent, and he buries treasure. Why? What do you say? What did the man with the one talent say? Uh, we just talked about this in our Sunday school class. What did the man with the one talent actually say? He says what? I was afraid. So I hid it. I knew that you are a hard taskmaster. So I was afraid, so I hid my talent. Now, what did the master say? Nathaniel, what did the master say to him? What do you call him? You lazy, wicked servant. See, the problem we have is this. Oftentimes when we read passages like this, you can say to yourself, man, I don't want to be responsible for one person's death, let alone so many thousand. I don't want to mess up anyone's life in counseling. I don't want to lead the Bible study lest I quote the passage wrong and lead other people astray. But if God gives you that talent, and, and in the back of our mind, okay, we think God is what? A hard taskmaster. So 
actually hide our talents. And when you do actually do that, you actually fulfill what you believe about God. What did the Bible say instead? The Bible tells us to use our talents. Even as imperfect as we are, as broken as we are, and the question to the answer to the question, who can bear those sins, is who? Who can bear our sins? Edward, who can bear our sins? It's Jesus. Exactly. Jesus can bear our sins. And you're not left wandering alone by yourself. Christ gave us the strength. So be the leader, be the father. Be one who's willing to step out. Be the head. And God will give you strength. Last of all, David realized that he's not enough as a prophet or his king. But he's, he also realizes that he's not even not enough as a priest. Let me read to you the last verse, verse 18. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor, Erenua, Erenua, the Jebusite. Now, in case you don't know, Erenua, the Jebusite, is a Gentile. He's a Jebusite. He's not an Israelite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aaron went looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aaron Una went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aaron Una said, Why has my lord the king came to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king Aruna, gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aruna, No, but I will buy from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offering to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offering and peace offering. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. So what happened was that the angel of death came to this threshing floor. And what's actually very interesting about the threshing floor is what? Anyone know what a threshing floor is? Okay, a threshing floor, that's a place, if you don't know, it's a flat place where you take the weed you harvested and you take it and you take the weed, a bundle of it, and you throw it up in the air and you take an instrument that's kind of like a nunchuck and you beat that thing. And what happened? Well, the seed will fall to the ground, right? And all the husk, will, the wind will drive away. So what you get is you don't want the, the bad stuff, the, um, the husk. What's the word that's used in the Bible? But the husk, and all, but the seed will fall to the ground. And it's actually a picture of judgment, of the separation of the righteous and the wicked. So here at this threshing floor, the angel does stop. It's a representation of judgment. And what is more, it was when David bought this place, it becomes what? If you know your Bible, this place becomes where the temple is built. But there's something else. The name of this mountain is what? We're not told here, but if you read First Chronicles, you'll find out the mountain is called. Yo, did you get this? 
Mel Moriah. Mount Moriah is where, is where Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. So this is a place that's full of significance. But there's something else actually interesting about this as well. And it's this. Aruna is not a normal man. Because look at verse 21, 20. It says, and when Aruna looked down. Why did it say that he looked down? Well, of course you'll say, well, he's on, because he's on a mountain, he looks down at people. But there's another reason. And the other reason is actually found in verse 23, and this is very hard to translate into English. Our ESV version says, All this, O King, Ar Ar o king Aruna gives to the king. But literally, this verse actually says, All this, Aruna, the king, gives to the king. You see, Aruna could be a king. He would actually be of royalty. He would actually be like a Gentile king. Maybe he had royal blood in his family. Why is this important? I think because it ultimately points to the fact that the gospel is open to everyone, Jews and Gentiles alike, and also the Gentiles have a part in the gospel. And he, as a king, was going to give everything to David. But what did David say? I will not offer anything to God that costs me nothing. Hey, guys, when you serve God, a lot of times we can have a minimalist approach to serving God. I will only serve God when it costs me or I will only serve God if it's convenient for me. Or I will only serve God if it's not going to be too expensive, not going to make my house a mess. Or won't get my wife mad at me or my husband annoyed. Or give me trouble with my friends. David said what? I will, I will offer, not offer burnt offering to the Lord that costs me nothing. So David was willing to pay a price in order to serve God. And so this, he was able to offer the burnt offering. But note that the Gentile help this king make an offering. You see, the offering that he made, he couldn't do by himself. As a prophet, David can answer the question. As a king, he became the instrument of God's wrath to his own people. And the point, what's the point? The point, and part of the point is all of your celebrities will fail you. Well, that's part of the point. All your politicians, all your football heroes, everybody will fail you. But that's also, but more than that, what am I going to say? We need Jesus, right? He's the ultimate king. He's a king that will not harm his people. He's a prophet who can actually carry the burden of our sins. All of us. You know, some of us walk around with guilt and shame. 
we hurt somebody and we carry that scar. Maybe we sleep, slept with a woman and we sin against her and we before marriage. We sin against her and it's against God. And you carry around that shame. Or else you you cheated somebody. You cheated on a test. You got a better grades than someone failed. And you know that person should not have failed. And you know that your action affected someone else. You carried that weight. Who can carry their own sin? None of us. So when David said, Who can carry their own sins? Nobody except Jesus. You see, when you go to Jesus, he takes away your guilt. And as you become more and more like Jesus, he removes that shame from you as well. And so that's why David said, At the end of the day, he says this, my soul is greatly distressed. Let me fall in the hands of man, but let me, no, I'm sorry, let me fall in the hands of God, for his mercy is great. Just destroy my effect. But let me, let me, let me fall into the hands of man. Have you taken your burden to Christ Jesus, the King who can remove the King, the good sh- who's a good shepherd, who can take away, carry your burden, who will never lead you astray? All of our heroes in this life will lead us astray. All of our heroes will fail us. Jesus will not. Have you gone to the prophet who will speak God's true words to you, who says to you, come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And have you turned to the priest who doesn't need any help to take away your sin? who has, in fact, done it once for all. You see, the blood of animals that the people offer, even David offered there, is never will not be enough to take away your sins. But what Jesus has done will take away your sins. Have you gone to him? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. Thank you so much for your goodness and mercy in our lives. Thank you that we have a king who will never leave us, lead us astray. Thank you we have a prophet who speaks truly God's word and is not consumed and will not have any questions and who has the ability to carry all of our sins. And thank you we have a high priest who's a perfect sacrifice for all of our sins. Father, I just, we just pray, I just pray that you would help us to turn to Christ remove our guilt and our shame.